So it is my pleasure and honor to let you know that we have in this morning another distinguished lecture. Very well known Italian professor working in, in Germany at Frankfurt University, head of department, Relativistic Astrophysics, and the director of the Institute for Theoretical Physics at Goethe University of Frankfurt. Professor Luciana Rezola. He has kindly agreed to visit us and to give a series of lectures at this school. Professor Rezola completed his undergraduate degree in physics at the University of Bari and University of Trieste. After he received his Bay PhD under the supervision of John Miller from CISA in Italy, he passed through postdoc experience at the University of Illinois and Urbana-Champaign and specializing in black holes and neutron stars and he returned to CISA then. And finally, he became head of the medical relativity group at the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in Boston. Alongside his uh, colleagues, Pedro Fake and Michael Kramer, he received 14 million euro research grant for black hole research. So, he is also uh, an co-author of a textbook, very well-known textbook, Relativistic Hydrodynamics. It is very pleasure, pleasure for us to have him here for this school. Please join me to welcome Professor Rezola Luciana very warmly. Thank you, Alikram. Um, and Thank you. Please. So, um, welcome everybody. Um, it's always difficult to give a lecture at a school because, uh, in contrast to what you have in a classroom, uh, you never know what are what is the level of the students, and you come from very different backgrounds, very different levels. So, the only way to make progress is if you stop me any time you don't understand something. Don't forget, you are here to learn and to ask questions. And I'm here to try and, and, and give these answers to these questions. If we fail, uh, it's, it's bad for both of us. So interrupt me anytime. The rules of the game are I give lectures, you follow. That means no laptops, no cell phones. I think you can do without your email for a couple of hours. And, um, <coughs> And I'll try to give a, a whiteboard lecture, at least for the first two, because they are a bit more mathematical. Uh, but the second two will be made more on, on the, with, the, with the Beamer. So lecture one and two will, uh, this morning will be about, so, so the, topic, <laughs> the topic I'll cover is binary neutron stars. And I'll try to explain there is a lot of things you can do with binary neutron stars. The first two lectures will be about mass and, and how you model uh, neutron star binaries. Uh, as you will see in lectures two and th uh, three and four, there is a lot of nice things you can do, but I also would like to impress that this is not something that happens by magic. There is a, a very solid mathematical theory that allows us to do these calculations. Lecture two, uh, three will be about the physics of neutron stars, what is it we can learn by, in terms of physics, so gravitational physics, nuclear physics, from uh, binary neutron star mergers. And lecture four will be instead on the astrophysics. What is it that we can understand in terms of these as astrophysical objects? Okay. So for lectures one and two, I'd like to suggest a few books. Um, these are Alcubierre, uh, Baumgarten, Shapiro, Gogu Yon, and then there are a couple of chapters in my book that also covers part of the stuff that I will uh, discuss today. So, um, let's start going. Uh, the equations we want to solve are very well known, and these are the Ansen's equations. So, does every, is everybody able to read what I'm writing? If you can't, then I will use the beamer, but if you, if you, if you can, then, then we're fine. Um, how many people do not know these equations? Please raise your hands. 
Okay? So most of you know these are second order partial differential equations that uh, on, on the left hand side have what is called the Einstein tensor. This is a single tensor which is a measure of the geometry of the system. And on the right hand side there is an energy momentum tensor which uh, tells you about the matter or energy content of the space time. So this is telling you that geometry is equal to energy. These are the Einstein's equations. Uh, in addition to this equation, you want to conserve fields. In particular, you want to conserve matter. And so you need two conservation equations um, that conserve the relevant quantities uh, that the system has to conserve. So energy, momentum, and mass. And so the first equation is a conservation equation for the mass current. You can also write this as d mu rho u mu where rho is the rest mass density and u is the full velocity of the fluid. Okay, so whatever fluid is flowing, if it, if it flows in one direction, has to come, go and come back in another direction. And then you want to conserve energy and momentum. So is the divergence, the four divergence, this is a four dimensional covariant derivative of this energy momentum tensor. Okay, so this is conservation of mass, if you want and its conservation of energy and momentum. This object over here, T mu nu, is a tensor that can be seen as the combination of many different tensors. If you have only a fluid, then this would be just a energy momentum tensor coming from the fluid, and, and that's easy. But most of the times, that's not enough, especially in astrophysics. You need to take into account the fact that it's not just a fluid that is under, undergoing some, some uh, motion, but there are also fields, electromagnetic fields or scalar fields, in which case, you know, you will have to add here to this tensor um, a part which has got to do with, uh, with the electromagnetic field. If there is a scalar field, you will have something associated with a scalar field and so on and so forth, okay? So this energy momentum tensor can be, uh, add, can be seen as a combination. And what you are asking is the conservation of this total energy momentum tensor. And in, if you have additional fields, then you will have additional equations that you will have to solve for. So for instance, if you have a electromagnetic field, then you will have a certain uh, Faraday tensor that you need to, to conserve and, you know, two sets of equations can come from the first two Maxwell equations and then you will have another equation that tells you about the other two, uh, uh, the other two Maxwell equations. Okay, so these are Maxwell equations. <clears throat> and this is the Faraday tensor. Uh, this is the energy momentum tensor. For a perfect fluid, this would be given by rho e plus rho u mu um, u nu, sorry, e plus p. This is the energy density. And this is the pressure. And G mu nu is the, the metric tensor. So I'm trying to give all the names of all the quantities that you see on this board. Let's see if I forgot something. Uh, this is the Ricci tensor. OK, this is what I forgot, fluid velocity, and this is the density. OK, so these are the equations that you, if you want to, to model binary neutral stars, you have to solve. Hmm? How do you do this? Um, well, these are tensor 
covariant equation. That means they are tensor equations. You can write them in any coordinate system that you wish. You are free to do whatever you want. And, uh, and Einstein said even something more subtle, that space and time actually do not differ. You can think of time just as a spatial coordinate, so that you know, thinking of me going to the left or me thinking going uh, in the past or in the future are conceptually and mathematically equivalent. So while this is true and, 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 and it remains true, we have to bear in mind that we, we have a certain perception of things where time is a preferred direction. Things happen, and, and our brain thinks in terms of uh, things happening at a given time, in the past, and in the future. Not only that, all of the methods that we know about solving equations that come from mathematical uh, theory, numerical analysis, have the idea or have been developed to solve problems where time is a, an evolving quantity. And, and so the... Um, the idea that, that uh, people already in the 60s uh, have uh, pushed is you take a given manifold, so this is a given uh, you know, collection of events, you take a metric G, and out of this you go on and do a 3 plus 1 splitting of space-time. So this is a, an operational choice. It's not a dictated by the equations. And in fact, you can, do, you, can, you can just say, I don't like this. I would like to have a different representation of, of, uh, of, of, the, of the manifold. But this is the way it's much easier for us to do it. And so what we do is, um, We take, we take this manifold, so, uh, this, you know, you have to think this is a, a container, I like to think of manifold as a container that contains certain things, and these things are called events. Um, so this is M, and I take M, and then I take a slice of it. Okay, take a slice, I draw it like that. And I have infinite different ways of setting this slice. But the way I choose is that I say that t on this slice, so I have a certain coordinate that I've laid to cover these events. And I say that on this slice, all of the events have the same time coordinate. Okay? All events <coughs> have same time coordinate. And you may say, well, what, what, wait a second, what is time? And I say, I don't care. It's one of the four coordinates. So I choose this object, and I take a slice where I've chosen the slice in such a way that one coordinate, I call it time, you call it whatever, is the same for all of the events on this. OK, so that's the first step. I need to use this one now. <clears throat> Once you have a slice, the next thing you want to do is understand where is the future and where is the past. Okay? You just said time here is the same, but I would like to know where is it that time is growing and where is it that time is decreasing or where is the future, and where is the, the past. And that's not too difficult to do. So you can think that um, you define a one norm, which is normally called omega mu, which is just the covariant derivative of the time coordinate. So this one norm is telling you in which direction this coordinate t is growing. And you can think, therefore, that uh, omega mu is oriented like so. Okay? Everywhere on this slice, I can think 
I can define this one norm omega nu. And this now allows me to define what is, you know, where things are growing, where, where things are decreasing. In particular, I can define the L2, the, the, the norm of this uh, one norm, which is just the contraction of omega, so it would be g mu nu omega mu omega nu, and this would be just uh, g mu nu nabla mu t nabla nu t. And this is, for the, I have no reason to believe that this is a constant. Actually, this is a function. And so I call this function minus alpha to the minus 2, so 1 over alpha squared. Okay? And I call this quantity the lapse. For you now, this is just a name. Later on, it will become clear what, why it has got actually this name. And so it's a way of ordering uh, things. And now I can think I can define another slice of the same type of uh, sigma t is a different one. Um, but has the same properties, that is, on this slice, everything is as a constant coordinate, and so I call or sigma of t plus delta t to, to indicate that this is different from sigma t. And I can use omega to know whether this new slice is above or below my first slice. Okay? Questions, comments? Something else that I can define, I have a slice. Something, so this is just telling me, this is not a vector, this is a one form. It's just telling me in which direction time coordinate is changing. But if I, because I have a slice, I have a surface, I can define the normal, right? Anytime you have a slice, you have a surface, you can define a normal. So I can define the normal to sigma t. And this normal will be just given by, will be just parallel to the one norm. So it will be g mu nu omega nu, or if you want minus alpha g mu nu nabla nu of t. And the condition I impose is that, well, this is naturally a time-like vector, right? Why is, it, why is it naturally a time-like vector? Who can answer this qu question? Say it again, say it again. Well, first of all, I haven't even said that. <laughs> so you cannot give me as, that as an answer. It is time-like because it is parallel to omega. And omega is a long time, and so it must be time-like. Now impose that it is unit time-like. So time line comes from being proportional to omega. Unit comes from the fact that I impose that n mu and n mu is equal to minus 1. So I could give this any number I want, but I give it 1, and it's minus because it's a time-like vector. OK, so now I can draw. Fortunately, I don't have a whole lot of colors I can use that would be compatible. Anywhere on these lines, I can, I can draw a little vector which is my normal to the, um, to the slice. And actually, this is very useful. It's a very useful vector because it allows me to define a spatial metric. You see, um, 
I, I was starting from this object, M, the manifold, and I was starting with a four-dimensional metric. But then I started uh, slicing things, and this brings up a, a, a new need, a need of defining distances on sigma. So I can define, by the way, something I mentioned to say, all of, all of this is on, on some lecture notes I will give you out. So you need not write everything because anyway it's written in the notes. I can define this new tensor, gamma mu nu, which is defined as <coughs> g mu nu, the one I already know, it's the metric of the, the manifold, plus a, con a, a double tensor, a rank two tensor given by n mu n nu. And, uh, and so now I have two important tensors of different ranks, but still two important tensors, gamma, this metric, and the normal n. Why is it that they are important? Well, they are important because out of these two objects, I can build two projectors i.e. two operators that transform a generic tensor, a generic four-dimensional tensor into either a fully spatial or a fully time-like tensor. Okay, so the way you do this is you introduce this mixed object, gamma mu nu, which is defined as g mu alpha gamma alpha nu, and so this would be just delta mu nu plus and mu and u, and you introduce another object which is this uh, project, time like projector. So I'd like to have two rank two tensors, gamma and n, with uh, one contravariant and one covariant index, and this I define to be minus n mu and u. To see how much you have followed, let me ask you this question. What is this? What do I write here? What is the result of that scalar product? Zero. Zero. Why zero? Well, because these are two orthogonal operators, okay? So the way you have to think about it, is that you have your, um, yes, where is the blue? You have your sigma, your time like t constant uh, slice. Then you have any object that you want, a tensor which is a, you know, a full four dimensional tensor, I like have rounded t. And then you have these two operators that allow you to take <coughs> uh, this tensor and, and, and find the projection. So you will have a, a fully spatial projection, and this would be gamma dot t, okay? I'm acting on t with gamma, or I will have a fully time-like projection, and this will be n dot t, okay? And of course, gamma dot n is equal to zero. 
questions, comments? So, well, it could be a higher rank tensor, and so it might have more components. But what you said is right. A time like tensor has all the spatial components equal to zero, and only the time components non zero, and vice versa. A fully spatial tensor um, has only spatial co uh, components non zero. So, Although, you know, in, in the future, I, I, I might still consider this to be a four-dimensional tensor. For notation, I will give, you know, I could call this guy R, okay? And I could still give uh, Greek indices uh, to this guy because it's convenient when I project it. But this object, you have to think, is an object where a part of it is zero and, all the, and then the other part is non-zero, and the same here, OK? So for notation, I can still consider this to be a fully four-dimensional object, but I know that a part of it is zero. Hmm? That was a good point. So question, what does G what, what do we use G4 in, 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 uh, in this manifold? What is useful? Why is this an important tensor? What is the metric there for? OK, it's a bit vague as, as, as an answer, Serkan. Describes the geometry. Uh, a bit more precise. Right, that's the second, the, the, the second definition is the one I need. It defines the distance between events. So I take two events in this manifold, A and B, wherever they are placed, and may ask, what is their distance? And their distance, ds squared, will be just g mu nu dx mu dx nu, OK? So it gives me a distance, g gives me a distance in m. Then you can understand that gamma gives me a distance on sigma. Okay? So just like um, G gives a distance in four dimensional manifold M, gamma gives a distance on three-dimensional sigma t. So I haven't remarked this because I think it's self-explanatory. By the time I take a slice, my, my slice is three-dimensional because I've cut out one dimension. Okay? So if I now want to know the distance between two points on sigma t, okay, say these two points over here, I want to know how far apart they are. I need not use g, I can just use Gamma. OK, so um, one point that we have to clarify is, you know, we want to go from these equations, g mu nu nu equal 8 pi t mu nu, to a 3 plus 1 version of those equations. And if you remember, there is an operator which is essential in defining the energy, uh, the, the, the Einstein tensor, and, and then the Riemann tensor and the Ricci tensor, which is the covariant derivative. Okay, what you have here, if you dig down deep down, you have that these are just covariant derivatives. So what we need now is a covariant derivative of. We need equivalent of covariant derivative on sigma t. And I know how to calculate 
the covariant derivative, say, D, um, I know how to calculate nabla rho of a given tensor T sigma tau. Okay? And I would like to have the equivalent, so this is in, in, uh, in 4D, and I would like to have the equivalent, which I call D, little d, well, capital D, but uh, not a, a, a nabla, of this new tensor T. Let me say that I want this to be called T alpha beta delta. How do I go from this object, that I think you all know how to compute, okay, over to this object? Suggestions are taken. Yes? You can decompose the metric. Okay. Yes? Then we can write the Yeah, but you don't need to do that because you have already introduced these two objects. So all you have to do, and this is why it's nice, is use one of these two objects. Which one do you have to use? Gamma. gamma. OK, so all you have to do here is put in three gammas. Voila. And then you have to get the indices right. OK? So you get an alpha here. You get a, a delta. A, a sigma and a delta, and here you have a, a tau, a beta, and a rho. Okay? So now this is the spatial equivalent of the covariant derivative. So you've taken the covariant derivative, and you have contracted each of the index with this uh, operator over here. Okay? So, and you will not be surprised to find out that if you do all of the, of, of the uh, just like this was true, that, that the, uh, <clears throat> the metric E has 0, 4 divergence, you will find out that D mu of, of gamma mu nu is 0 now. OK? So uh, the way we say is that the covariant derivative is compatible with the metric, the four metric. This is the three covariant derivative is compatible with the three metric. Okay, I don't write this because it would take too long. OK, let me erase here. OK, so how do I use the fact that I've introduced the, the basic uh, the basic uh, differential operator, the covariant derivative. I, I can just go back to what I know in four-dimensional relativity, where I start with g mu nu, which I know comes from r mu nu, which I know comes from uh, actually, I should do the other way around, right? Which I know comes from the Riemann tensor, which I know comes from the uh, from the you know the Christoffel symbols, and which I know comes from the covariant derivative. Okay. So if you remember the way you've studied general relativity and ended up with the answer in tensor is you introduce the covariant derivative, the Christoffel symbols. These were used to de define the uh, Riemann tensor, then the Riemann ten uh, the Riemann te the Ricci tensor, and then the answer in tensor. So we do have to follow the same logic here. And we have now to this new operator, which is d mu, out of which we will get a gamma mu nu gamma alpha beta is just a, to remind myself that this is not, that just like this is a, a three-dimensional operator and I have used a li different letter to remind me. Here, I cannot use a different letter. I will be confused. So I'll put a little index here, three. So this is uh, to remind that this is really an object living on sigma, out of which I build a three version of the uh, curvature of the Riemann curvature. 
arm you new alpha beta out of which I build a three version of the Ricci tensor out of which I build a three version of the Einstein tensor. Okay, I hope you are still all following. So, how do I define these objects? Well, it's very easy. I, I just have to use exactly the same definition that I used when I was defining these objects in a four-dimensional space. So, gamma 3 alpha beta delta is equal to 1 half. <coughs> so, yeah, let me, let me start with the, the four-dimensional, okay? This would be G alpha um, mu. And then I have here three spatial derivatives. You know, everybody has his own mnemonic way of computing this. Mine is that I take uh, the um, d mu of g beta delta. So I take the last two indices for the last object. I put a minus sign, and then I permute. So I would have delta g mu beta. And I would have here d beta g delta mu. And you can have now the same object in a three-dimensional slice, gamma 3 beta delta, will be exactly the same as this guy, where I re simply replace g with gamma. So I have alpha mu, and I have d beta gamma delta mu plus d delta gamma mu beta minus d mu gamma beta delta. So I've done the very first uh, step of my, of my construction. I have defined the spatial covariant derivative. And out of the spatial covariant derivative, I've defined the Christoffel symbols. <coughs> I would like to calculate this guy over here. Does anyone remember how you calculate that object in full four-dimensional? Yes. It's not just a double covariant derivative. It's the anti-symmetric double covariant derivative, right? You have to take first in one direction, then in another direction, then compare, OK? So if you remember, uh, taken a vector field w mu and um, and taking the, the 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 twice the covariant antisymmetric derivative say alpha beta of this object w delta this would give you a a right hand side which is either zero or if it is non zero is proportional to uh, the alpha beta W mu, OK? So for those who are not familiar, who don't remember this, uh, the idea is that you take a vector field, <coughs> w, and you first move it in one direction, and then in another direction, let's say you make a path in a clockwise manner, and you, after the pilot transport, this would be your new vector. And you do the same on an on a anti-symmetric path, or say, in a clock, uh, counterclockwise direction. And then you have a new object, w prime. And you look at the difference between these two. And if this is a difference, this is embodied by this tensor. If it is not, if there is no difference, as you would expect in flat space time, then uh, you say that the curvature is 0. So we do exactly the same here, but with this new differential operator, which we've just introduced. So it's do twice d alpha beta w delta is equal to r3 <coughs> mu delta alpha beta w mu, OK? And well, you know, this object has the obvious ob properties th that it is fully spatial. So if I take this object mu alpha beta delta, and I contract it with, uh, with the 
normal vector to the slice, what do I get here? Sorry? No, I don't get the time light. Zero. Because this is already fully spatial. OK? And OK, just for notation, for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, square brackets, if I have a tensor and I have the indices between two square brackets, I'm just saying this is the combination of T alpha beta minus T beta alpha. And so in, in, in exactly the same manner, you can calculate, um, so these are fully spatial, and you know, I will not go into the details, but you will see that R3, R alpha, beta, uh, gamma, delta will be a function of what? In 4D, this is a function of, of what? Yes, Chris, well, you know, a metric is in the Christopher symbol, so just concentrate on Christopher symbols. So it's Christopher symbol squared, okay? Let me call it gamma squared, okay? So this is the four dimensional object, gamma squared. And as you said correctly, it's the second derivative of the Christopher symbols. Sorry, is the, is the, 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 the first derivative of the Christopher symbols. OK? And if you look at, at the dimensions of this object, <clears throat> the Christoffel symbol is a derivative of the metric, and so it's 1 over a length. So this is 1 over a length squared. This is the derivative of a, of a Christoffel symbol. So this goes like a, a, a length to the minus 2. And so this is a curvature. It's the inverse of the curvature radius, or the square of the curvature radius. And you can do exactly the same here. I will not do it. All I'll do is, because I'm lazy, I'll just put in a 3. Okay. So I can, the, I can, I can work out what is the, uh, the, the 3 Riemann tensor. And this will be just a combination of the 3 Christoffel symbols uh, on sigma t. And once I have this guy, I can calculate the three Ricci. Do you remember how you calculate the, the Ricci in, in general relativity, in four dimensional general relativity? Uh, say alpha, beta. This would be the contraction of the first and third index. Okay. And I do exactly the same here. Okay. Out of R3, I get the Ricci tensor. And out of the Ricci tensor and its contraction, I uh, will get the, the three Ricci scalar, which is therefore the contraction of the Ricci tensor. OK, so we should not lose track of what it is that we're doing, OK? We are we're trying to, essentially, what we're doing is we're doing differential geometry in a 3 plus 1 splitting. Um, it has taken us a lot of time to learn differential geometry in a four-dimensional manifold, uh, space-time. And now what I've done is I've broken up that, or I've, I've, I've recycled that notion to do differential geometry in a subspace, this three-dimensional subspace. Is it clear so far? Are there questions? Yes. Uh, I didn't quite understand the uh, omega, uh, W vector. Is that, is that a vector or vector field? I didn't understand. It, it doesn't really matter whether it is a vector or vector field. So for, for all practical purposes, you can think in this Sketch is a vector, a single vector, but you can think it's in more general footings, it's a vector field. Okay? And what you do is, don't, don't, don't forget that the, the covariant derivative of a vector field is the parallel transport. Okay? And this is a, a very lazy way of writing. I'm writing nabla alpha, nabla beta of W delta minus now. Uh, 
minus nabla beta nabla alpha of w delta. And the first part I can think is I'm taking the derivative in a given direction, the one given by alpha. You know, you can introduce a vector field in the direction alpha. And so I first take along alpha and then along beta, actually the other way around, okay? In this case, I first take along beta and then alpha. And then I subtract to this, this is what I was doing over here, is the subtraction operation <coughs> of what I would have obtained if I had gone the other way, first in one direction and the other. Now, in partial derivatives commute, covariant derivatives do not commute in a, in a curved space time. And, 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 and this is then measured. So if this is non-zero and you want to know, well, how large it is, this is embodied in this object R. And I've done just the same because now I have introduced this simpler, well, this, this operator on, on, on sigma, and I can do exactly the same logic. So instead of thinking of doing a parallel transport in a four-dimensional space, you are really doing a parallel transport in, on sigma. Other questions? Okay, so there is one point that uh, I was hoping you would ask me for, uh, but you haven't, so I will have to ask you. What the heck is the difference between this object and, and this object? Well, you, you can say, well, this, this has, some of these components are zero, right? Because I'm looking at it just on, on, on a slice. Which means that this object has more information than this object, okay? So this tensor has some components that are identically zero, all the time related. And this means that this object has more information than R3. Okay, so I think we all agree this uh, is a fact. Now we have to try and understand what is this additional information that we're missing. And in order to understand what is that we are missing, maybe we understand better what is this R. Again, I have my time uh, sorry, a space like T constant slice, sigma T. And this is measuring curvature on this slice, okay? R3 measures intrinsic curvature on, on sigma t. So I can think I have developed an app which allows me to go around in this room and measure locally uh, this, this quantity. It's not actually very difficult to, to do this app. You will find it's almost zero, so that's why people don't use it. But you can build an app that measures locally the intrinsic curvature here in this room or you know, in the next room. So this is telling us about the intrinsic curvature in this room, but we have no idea about the, the, the way this surface is oriented or bent with respect to the manifold, the four-dimensional manifold, because we have no measure of this four-dimensional, this additional dimension, okay? So we need, uh, so the missing information is on how is sigma t bent with respect to m, to the manifold, okay? We have no idea because all the information that we have is the information on sigma, okay? It's like imagining you are a two-dimensional object and you're moving on a two-dimensional surface. You have no idea what the surface, the topology of the surface, no? Okay, is this clear? So what we need is a measure 
of the extrinsic curvature, what is called extrinsic curvature. And if you want, the extrinsic curvature is exactly the piece of information that was contained in this object and is missing in this object. OK, so how do we, how do we calculate the extrinsic curvature of, of a surface? Any suggestion on how to do this? What is that you project? Next, next slice. I don't know anything about next slice. I don't, know, I don't care about the next slice. All I have is one slice, sigma t. And all the information I have to use is on sigma t. So I, have, I, I take a, a cut of this so that I have, this is my sigma t, OK? And I want to know, I want to measure all of these nice smooth bending that I've shown you here. How would you do this? Right, don't forget, you still have a normal vector. So you have a normal vector over here. And you have a, because it is a vector field, you have another normal vector over here. Uh, well, I clearly have done it wrong. Well, uh, the normal vector there would be here, let's say. So this would be the normal vector uh, n at p. This would be the normal vector n prime at p prime. And then I can, take of, I can think of uh, taking n, pilot transporting over here, and this would be n tilde. And what do I do then? I need to calculate the difference, this difference over here. OK, so this would be delta n. And what else do I need to do? I need to project. I need to make sure that this object is a fully spatial object, because what I want is a, an extrinsic curvature on sigma t. And so what I do is I just take, uh, what I can say is that I will have a tensor, a two, rank 2 tensor, k, which will go like the projection of uh, delta n. If you want to be a bit more mathematically correct, what you define is that well, uh, kappa mu nu is defined as minus gamma lambda mu, the three covariant derivative of the normal vector. OK? So this is called the extrinsic curvature. And the, 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 the mathematical understanding comes from here. It's just telling you about the bending, and the way you measure it is you take the, the, the normal vector, you, you, you pilot transport, that's why you, we have a covariant derivative, then you project it so that you have a fully spatial object. Okay? This is a fully spatial object. Okay? So you can think you know, in a very loose manner that <clears throat> r mu alpha beta nu is like the 3 r mu alpha beta nu plus the covariant, plus the extrinsic curvature. When you put these together, you have all the information that was in this tensor now is in these two tensors. Why do I need a rank 2 tensor? Why not just one? I mean, all I need to do is covariant derivative along one direction. You do need a rank 2 tensor because the extrinsic curvature might be, the, the, the covariant derivative might be zero in one direction, but non zero in another direction. I know this sounds like crazy. Um, think about a plane, OK, this sheet. This sheet has zero extrinsic curvature. I take any normal vector and move it around, will always be the same after parallel transport. 
imagine now you have a, a cylinder, okay? It's the same as, as, <coughs> as a plane. If I take the normal vector and I move it along the z direction, say, wouldn't be, there would be zero extrinsic curvature. But if I move it in this direction, then I would see that the, the, the vector changes. It's pointing in different positions. Okay? So you might have it on a surface. The extrinsic curvature in one direction is zero while it is not in another. And that's why you need two indices in your vector, in your tensor. So the, let me go back to the example. The intrinsic curvature of a, of a sheet of paper here is what? Is zero, it's flat, and so is the extrinsic curvature. The intrinsic curvature of a, a cylinder is what? Zero, because it's the same, I haven't done anything special, but the extrinsic curvature is non zero. Take a sphere, two sphere, then the intrinsic and the extrinsic curvature in that case are both non zero. Okay? So these are really independent measurements that uh, you have to bear in mind. There are other ways in which you can define uh, the extrinsic curvature, but I will, you, you will find them in the notes. I will not go into the details. OK, so, so much with that. Where was I? I'm there. Questions, comments? <coughs> Oh, because it's, it's well, you know, who's asked this? I would fail any student who puts an equal sign. I mean, look at this object. This has 40, ob these indices are just two, okay? It's just a conceptual, you know, equivalence, not, not a, a mathematical equivalence. They are really different objects. Okay, so... <clears throat> Yes. Uh, this example isn't it a single-dimensional microsurface? In three-dimensional, in another dimension. Yes, in a three-dimensional, you certainly would have a, a. Sorry, I don't understand what is your question. So. No, okay, you, you, are, you, are, you still have to think about, you know, the two indices will give you all the information that you need. It's not that because you are in 3D, then you need a, a rank three tensor. That's what you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah. no, the, the number of indices has got nothing to do with the dimensionality. Yeah. Okay? Just like, you know, the... the, the You are, you're just going in the wrong direction, okay? Think about Riemann tensor. In 4D or in ND, it's exactly the same formula. The only thing that changes is the, you know, the, in, the, num, the components of the indices, yes. okay? And it's the same here. No. <laughs> I'm saying you're going in the wrong direction. Don't insist in that. We can think about, we can discuss about this. Okay, so, um, Malikam, what, what, what do we do? Uh, we have a break or? Okay, so um, let's break for, for five minutes or, or, or so. 10 minutes, okay. So I'll see you in 10 minutes.